Well, I am delighted to be here. My name is Andrew Himes, and I want to uh, introduce uh, the folks that are with me today. Jeff Thiel um, is right here. Jeff and I are partners in Carbon Innovations, which is a business consultancy focused on business-based solutions to climate change. And Jeff is uh, also a member of the Mercer Island Presbyterian Church, um, and I'm on the best for year. Our major current initiative is something called Carbon Smart Building, which is a partnership with the Carbon Leadership Forum at the University of Washington, and, um, and is focused on how do we get the entire uh, built environment globally to carbon net zero by 2030 for operational energy and by 2050 for all forms of carbon emissions connected with buildings. So I've uh, been learning a huge amount over the last couple of years about this uh, in incredibly interesting topic um, and challenging topic to me. Um, secondly, uh, Penelope Jackson right here. Uh, another friend, uh, uh, Penelope is also a member here at St. Mark's Cathedral and she's the Director of Business Development for an investing service of Gitterman Wealth Management which offers investment opportunities in environmental, social, and governance. Uh, you're going to be hearing more about that kind of impact investing uh, during this hour. Um, and Aljen Connolly, right here, is the Director of Carbon Economics at NORI, uh, which is the world's only transparent and secure carbon dioxide removal marketplace. We won't get into a lot of technical details here, uh, but one thing that uh, Alden will help us do Alden is actually one of the uh, North American experts on carbon, on the carbon footprint of human activity and human economics. And so she's going to help us understand a little bit more about carbon footprint and about carbon offsets. And uh, also, I, I think the Alden's uh, home is the United Church of Canada. You're here from, from uh, Vancouver. And she spent several years as a governor for the Vancouver School of Theology. Um, so she has she wears multiple hats. So to start with, I want to talk about this slide just a little bit to just set context. This slide shows that for all, virtually all of, of history of this planet, going all the way up to the very, very recent past, the, the um, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of our planet has rarely gone past about 280 parts per million. This is a tiny amount, but a very significant amount. And during that time, there have been various uh, fluctu major fluctuations. There have been ice ages and other periods of human history, or uh, actually planetary history, uh, that, in that included very warm periods of time. Uh, but in that entire time, up to uh, the last 100, 150 years, carbon in the atmosphere has never gone above this level, about 300 parts per million. And today, today, it's up to about 410 parts per million, way off the scale. Way, way, way off the scale. Um, and that portends some uh, extremely challenging um, extremely challenging uh, moments for all of human society. The, um, one of the questions I think that almost all of us are interested in understanding better is in the face of dire odds, and I won't go into detail about what those odds are, I think we're all aware of, of what climate change threatens um, as an existential threat. Uh, but in the face of those dire odds, what can we do? What is there to be actually done practically, measurably, effectively to confront the, um, the threat of climate change and also to mitigate its consequences? And one of the things uh, that I also want to kind of share here is, um, so that's a uh, little animation that, that <laughs> Jeff worked out that I had <laughs> Surprise. figured out. Surprise! Oh, yeah, so way up here. It's Wait till you see what's coming. No. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, other th the other concept that I wanted to open with is something called the social cost of carbon. So we've all heard about, for example, you get on a Alaska Airlines and you're offered the opportunity to offset your, offset your carbon emissions for that flight. Um, and that the price of that um, carbon offset might be 10 or $12, somewhere in that range. 
The social cost of carbon, however, takes into account the entire impact of carbon emissions on all of human society and on the planet. The social cost of carbon, it's a, it's a number to, for the first time developed uh, formally and officially by the United States government in the early 1980s during the Reagan administration. And by law, the US government assembled the, the data, uh, assembles the data to create a number um, uh, that uh, reveals the social cost of carbon, that is the health impacts, the environmental impacts, and the economic impacts of carbon emissions per metric ton. And what you'll see on this, uh, on this uh, slide right here, if you had more time to look at it in more detail, you'd find that as of today, the social cost of carbon recorded by the United States government is approximately $40 per metric ton. This slide was developed by the National Resources Defense Council, and it shows that by 2030, the social cost of carbon will be at about $175 per, per ton of carbon emitted. And as a matter of fact, we've got a lot of evidence that it could be far higher than that. So we want to talk about solutions today. And um, along the way, I, I think uh, before I introduce or let Jeff uh, come up here, I just want to kind of focus on if, if, if you want to think about solutions, you have to think about a three-stage process. And I'd like you know, all of us to memorize this three-stage process, and Jeff is going to be talking more about it. First stage is measure what your carbon footprint is measure what your carbon footprint is on an individual and an institutional basis. Number two is reduce your carbon footprint however, in whatever practical way you can, possibly can. And number three is offset the carbon emissions that you're not able to reduce. So measure, reduce, and offset. That, those are the three key words that we're going to be talking about today. So Jeff, if you'd uh, come on up here and spend a, a few minutes going through what are the strategic solutions to climate change and to carbon pollution in the atmosphere. Thank you. All right, so my goal here today is to give all of us who are probably at least somewhat anxious, maybe fully on depressed by the things that are happening to our planet right now, to give us all a pep talk. Because I think we can solve this problem. I think human ingenuity is powerful when it's channeled with purpose and urgency <coughs> towards a specific problem. So I'm not giving up yet. And what I want to do today with you is simply share some of the things that we have in our toolkit right now that we can go do that will have a huge impact. So at the moment, however, we're still on this track track right here. We haven't even really varied in our ever increasing emissions of greenhouse gases due to the demands that we all have for energy and the growing number of people on the planet. And if that continues, you know, this is a, a wild guess. Really. We don't know, frankly, what the ultimate outcome would be. We know it will be very bad. So this can't, this can't persist. We have to change, all of us, in many ways. First, we have to stop the ever-increasing trajectory, and then we have to figure out how to dramatically decrease it and live in a way that will allow the, the planet to stay in balance. So when I say we, it's important to understand at the outset that we all contribute, but in very different degrees. And I want to just do a little test here with, with you all to find out what you know about how, uh, who impacts the current global emissions of greenhouse gas emissions and by how much. So here are a bunch of bars that represent countries or in some cases regions of the world. And um, this is the per capita emissions of greenhouse <coughs> gases, gases in those countries. So I'm just going to take, uh, this is going to be a quiz, so <coughs> audience quiz here. I'm going to take uh, input from the floor. Who do you think is the bar on the left? Anyone? China. China. U.S. or China? Yeah. A lot of people said China. I heard China. United yeah. States. What, what else did I hear? Canada. U.S. U.S. US. 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 Okay. Canada. You are right. That is us. We are the biggest emitters per capita 
of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And um, this actually understates our emissions because this is based on production and use of energy. Well, guess what? We outsourced a lot of our pollution to Asia and other places. We buy back the goods very happily, but uh, a molecule of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide does not care whether it's being emitted in Beijing or Tijuana or London. It all goes into the same troposphere that we all share, and it mixes evenly around the world. So it doesn't matter. It's all the same. So the Union of Concerned Scientists thinks that our true impact, when you take into account all those goods we import, probably more like 20. How about the next one? Anybody want to guess? China. 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 It's still Australia. China. Australia. No, Saudi Arabia, for example. <laughs> oh, that, that's probably not surprising, right? Their wealth is all based on fossil fuels. They're a very wealthy country. And some really strange things happen when you have too much of a good thing. They burn a ton of, of uh, natural gas right when it's coming out of the ground. It doesn't go anywhere or do anything. They just burn it off because the oil wells aren't, aren't um, equipped to capture that and put it to good use. So there is a whole bunch of that kind of waste that happens in uh, fossil fuels today. It never goes to any good purpose at all. Just straight emissions. All right, how about the next one? China. <laughs> okay, Russia. This is actually a, not a wealthy country overall, but again, they have a ton of fossil fuel resources, and so they aren't concerned about it, conserving them. Next one. China. Yes. <laughs> so you're with me. China. Yeah. Now this, you know, there are many more Chinese, but per capita. They, and, and by the way, if you adjust this for that carbon loophole of us, them, them building it, we, to serve us, right? Um, it's probably more like yeah. below six. So we're probably three to four times per capita the emissions of the average Chinese citizen. The next one is about to pick. Is China yeah. on target to grow the most in this though or not? So they are adding renewable energy faster than anyone in the okay. world and as fast as they possibly can because they're choking on the air over there and it's just not a good thing. However, we want them to produce so many goods, there's so much demand for that, that they continue to burn coal because they can use all the energy they can get. Alright, next one is the EU. This is the one place where I can actually say there's been some improvement recently. They're doing a lot with energy efficiency. They're converting to renewable sources of energy, especially in the Nordic countries. And does anybody, do we have any Swedes in the room or anybody with any Swedish descent? We got one in the back. Sure. Well, congratulations. Sure. The Swedes are the lowest emitting country per capita in the EU. And I found that really intriguing. So we're going to talk about that more in just a, in a minute. Because that's a developed country. It's a northern country. They make steel. They, they do all sorts of things that you know, we think of as being associated with industrialized countries. And yet, they're at one-fifth our emission level. Last two, India, and then really the rest of the world. right? And this is largely because they're not wealthy. Um, in fact, in India, there's still, what, 300 million people who have no access to electricity. Um, and they, they live in a, in a climate where they're mostly just burning wood for fuel or maybe propane. So with that in mind, let's take a closer look for a moment at Sweden and compare it to the United States. So of course, if you're going to make any sort of big change happen, you have to set goals. And then you have to back them up with actual policies that have an impact. Uh, so you have to have a plan to start. Well, they've been really uh, persistent in setting strong goals and then backing them up with real significant policies that have meaningful impact. They've had, a, a, for a while, a goal of being 50% clean energy. All uses, cars, you know, planes, uh, industry, uh, buildings in the economy, they made that in 2016. Um, their next stop was to get 63% reduction in greenhouse gases. Um, on the way to being zero by 2045. And I put that in debt because, yes, there will be some emissions associated with things happening in that country. They're going to offset them, and we'll talk a little bit more about various ways you can offset in a moment. Big contrast with the United States, we don't have any federal goals. And uh, the little goals that we sort of signed up for as part of the Paris Accord, we've been trying to back, you know, back out of. Uh, we do have states that have goals. 
Some of the states have backed those up with strong policies, but some of them are still largely a little bit empty. Uh, they're sort of empty promises. Um, when you look at the policies that Sweden has put in place, they've got a strong climate and integrated climate energy plan. They've had one for a long time. I think it even comes out of the same agency, if I understand their, their organization correct, correctly. They've had a broad carbon tax since 1995 that affects consumers, businesses, industry. Everybody is aware of the consequences because they get taxed for them of burning a lot of fossil fuels. <laughs> Along with that stick, they've got a carrot, um, and have had a portfolio of carrots over time for clean energy. We have a few of these things in, in here, you know, with EVs and solar panels. Um, they've been very good at, because the building sector is so significant, uh, making sure everybody's got information about the energy consumption of buildings. They understand exactly what the impact is if they buy a home or, you know, lease a, a space in the building. And they've given consumers choice. I don't have any choice. I get my uh, energy from uh, Puget Sound Energy, and it's about 60% fossil fuels based right now. Um, and the, the utilities in this country have not been challenged to go fix it. Uh, they're under sort of a different system. So I, I'm gonna, I've been asked to kind of hold questions, so if you could think of that, because I'm, I'm probably going to be long. But come, let's come back to that in a second. On the other hand, you know, our federal plan, we did have briefly uh, an attempt with, uh, under the Obama administration, with the Clean Power Plan to start implementing a policy, but it never actually got implemented. It got stuck in the courts and then got reversed recently. Some states do have cap and trade, so they have some, on some limited number of polluters, they have some form of uh, uh, pollution fee. We still subsidize oil, gas, and coal, and actually in some places right now, the Department of Energy has been, been trying to increase that subsidy. Um, building energy use is not very transparent in this country. It's very hard to know exactly what the impact is of a building. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, most of the power uh, purchases we made here, we, we, we don't really have any choice. It's all based on monopolies. So, you would think, oh, well, and, you know, the Swedes probably had to sacrifice greatly to do this. Well, it's not showing up in the numbers, I can tell you that. Uh, they are definitely not taking cold showers in the dark. Um, we've got uh, just a host of things in which they look like they're really doing well as a country. They are twice as efficient in their economy defined as the dollar value of goods and services that they produce relative to the energy that goes into doing all of that production. Um, they have already achieved in 2016 54% um, sourcing of renewable energy we were at 11% in 2016. The economic growth has been great. It's been higher than ours has for the past, since 1994. They're more productive, at least in one measure, which, you know, GDP per capita. Um, they're healthier in, in this statistic. They're about half as likely to die prematurely between ages 15 and, 15 and 60. Um, and then they score higher on the happiness index. So again, I don't see a lot of suffering here. This has not been a huge sacrifice to make these changes and to achieve the level of efficiency with respect to greenhouse gas emissions that they have. So how can, how can we achieve that? Uh, it would effectively amount to us cutting our greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, which is just in line with what the IPCC relatively recently said we need to accomplish if we're going to be able to turn that trajectory around. Um, the broad outlines of what we need to do are really clear. There's been a lot of really great work done by all sorts of academics, but it'll make sense when we talk about it here. First thing we've got to do is just be really efficient in how we use energy in our cars and in our buildings and in our industry. We've got to get all the fossil fuels out of our electrical grid. We're moving in that direction here in this, in this day, uh, but we also had a head start um, because of all the hydropower we've had. Then, wherever possible, we need to switch fuels to electricity or to biofuels. And then finally, we have um, allies in this challenge in the natural environment that we need to work with. We need to invest in the natural carbon sinks that are all around us that can help us bring this uh, system back into balance. So uh, I told you I'd tell you some good things. Here's a very good thing, and it's a very necessary thing. If we are going to start moving rapidly in the right direction, all of us in our, all the myriad little economic decisions we made have got to take into account the cost of the pollution associated with fossil fuels. Economists call it an externality, so we have to internalize those externalities. The way we do that, 
through a carbon tax. In the House of Representatives right now, we have a bill, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, H.R. 763, I encourage you to look it up, that would essentially do three things. It would put a significant and rising uh, fee on fossil fuels when they come into our economy, well ahead, before, you know, a pipeline. Collect all the fees, give them right back to households on a per capita basis. So this is a progressive tax because wealthy households have bigger carbon footprints than poor households. Wealthy households will contribute more uh, through higher prices at the pump and, you know, you know, for the natural gas they use to heat their home. Lower income households will get back more than they put in uh, through those price increases, because there will definitely be price increases uh, in some sectors. Then the final part of it, which I'm really intrigued in, I think could be revolutionary for the planet, is a border adjustment mechanism. So to make it possible for a company in this country to compete effectively uh, and on a level playing field with a company in a country that doesn't have a carbon tax, when goods cross the border, we'll adjust the fees accordingly. We either add fees to theirs, take fees away from ours, so that there's no penalty to being a producer in our country. The effect on this, I predict, is that other countries are going to simply say, well, we can let the Americans collect the money or we can collect it. <laughs> and then we can decide what to do with it. I think they're going to want to do the latter. So I, I think it would give you a lot of kind of an oomph for um, similar <coughs> policies around the globe. Buildings is another huge leverage point where there's a lot of good things happening. Um, it starts with measurement, as, as uh, Andrew referred to a moment ago. There's a lot of benchmarking of large commercial buildings that's happening, especially uh, in Europe, but also increasingly in major cities in the US. Seattle has such a program uh, where they keep track of the energy use intensity, EUI, of buildings. And you can actually go look it up online. Um, in homes, we just really haven't had much until very recently. I was involved in the uh, uh, implementation of the Portland Home Energy Score policy. So if you go sell your house in Portland right now, you'll be asked to have someone come in and do a little assessment. Uh, it costs about $150. And as a result of that, you will get a report that shows effectively the miles per gallon rating for your house. And along with that, you'll get a list of the things you could do that would improve your energy efficiency, and the likely uh, savings on your utility bill if you did those things. So hopefully, you know, before and after people buy is when they're most likely to make changes in their house. So hopefully they'll invest in, in addition to you know, granite co uh, countertops, they'll invest in boring things like insulation and air sealing, etc. Financing. Three minutes. Okay, financing is a huge challenge. So we've got to have more ways for people to finance these kinds of improvements that don't make them say, oh, I don't want to do it because I'm going to leave my house shortly. And then lastly, when it comes to new buildings, we already know how to do this. This particular design, this is in Manitoba, cut from the code, it cut the energy consumption relative to code by 70%. We have the knowledge and the tools to build much more efficient buildings in this <coughs> And it'll benefit us in many ways. So this is an example of an actual decision that my church is looking at right now, where at first they just looked at the price of a gas furnace and electric furnace, and yet the electric one is a little higher, so they were going to choose the gas one. I've been asking them to look not just at the current <coughs> upfront price, but the ongoing costs over time, and to consider the costs of the social cost of carbon. And when you do that, what you'll see is that there's, there's no comparison. It's a lot more expensive to go with gas. When you take this long-term holistic view than uh, <coughs> electric. So, and this is the savings associated with that, the carbon dioxide emission savings from making that decision. We have a lot of great options now in transportation that are a lot cleaner. Bikes that are electric can get you up a hill. You don't have to sweat to get your meeting necessarily. You can get a little power assist. Uh, I don't know if anyone else here has an electric car. Does anybody? Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy mine. It's clean, it's quiet, it's quick, it's a lot cheaper to operate. They can go a lot, lot farther with a lot less maintenance. So on a total cost of ownership over time basis, they're already cheaper. The upfront price, again, is a little higher. It's coming down. Um, but in the future, I predict a lot of people just in an urban environment won't even have a car. They're just going to 
in their phones that I need to get from point A to point B, and you'll get some mix of bike, bus, car. Um, the car may have a driver or may not. Uh, and then lastly, when it comes to biofuels, these are expensive right now, but that's because we don't put any price on the pollution from fossil fuels. If you start fully implementing those prices, things like algae farms um, are going to look like a good way to create fuel that can even be used in things like jets. <coughs> now, the big threshold that we've crossed recently is in the cost of producing clean energy. And just to simply summarize, unsubsidized, it's now less expensive because of the falling price of solar and wind to produce electricity with renewable so fuels than with gas or coal. So we should never again put in a gas power plant or a coal power plant. In fact, there are many cases where it would be cheaper to shut down the coal plant now and build a solar panel, even in the same spot, um, because of the declining costs. And these are continuing to come down. So it, it's all good news on that, on that front. Now, the, the one problem with that scenario, obviously, is that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and for that, we have batteries. And batteries are undergoing the same kind of dramatic price reductions, and they will continue to decline. And they're just now entering this period where they make a ton of sense in all sorts of applications. Your car, powering a home in combination with, in certain places with solar, um, and on the grid. Um, and, you know, you replace this leaky uh, um, natural gas repository in California with um, batteries. Lastly, we can do things in agriculture. I'm there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told him it was going to be tight. You gave me an extra slide, so you need to give me okay, one okay. minute extra time. <laughs> uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. so we, we today manage our agricultural lands in ways that have tendency to increase both the amount of carbon dioxide emissions, but also water loss. And we do that through killing them regularly, not putting cover crops on, having just you know two or three crops that we rotate, like soy, corn, wheat. Um, the result is higher erosion. Uh, we've lost a lot of topsoil. Uh, it takes a lot of diesel fuel and you know fertilizers, all made from petroleum, to uh, manage that kind of a system. And we have really unhealthy soils with low levels of carbon in them, which is a serious problem for the productivity of our agriculture. Farmers know how to do it differently, and increasing numbers of them, and Alvin will probably talk about this a bit, know that if they change their practices, they can put a lot of that carbon back. They can take it out of the air and put it back in the ground where it can be very helpful in our agriculture. All right, so this is where we come to the, the, the last part. You can undo your part in this whole drama, and you can work at this over time to have even more impact every year if you just do those three steps. First, start by measuring. Look not only at you know, the obvious ones of your utility bills and the number of miles you put on your car, if it's an internal combustion engine, um, but also look at food, goods, and services, because there's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions wrapped up in those, too. Um, general things that you could do, First thing and the most important thing is just use less energy. Be efficient wherever you can and then switch to clean sources. Um, this is a good thing to just kind of keep in your head. Reduce, reuse, recycle. So if you approach almost any purchase decision with that little um, rule of thumb in mind, you can help move us towards lower greenhouse gas emissions. And then offsets, which I believe we are going to talk about next. Right? Not quite, almost. Not quite, almost. almost. One more, and then we'll talk right, about right, offsets. Right. Okay, right. thank you. Okay. Is there going to be a chance for questions? Yeah, we're going to, what we thought we'd do is uh, walk through a set of little pr presentations, and then uh, we want actually you all to interact with each other and then with, with everybody. So we're going to try to plan that or design that into it. Do you have a quick question right this minute that we could take care of real quick? Or? Um, yeah, so several things. I've that I wanted to respond to. Uh, power choice for consumers, you mentioned Puget Sound Energy. They have both a green energy program, which you pay a little extra for, you get uh, you use alternative sources. Um, and they have net metering, which if you're a solar power user, net metering is actually more effective than batteries, um, at least currently. Uh, it was a different different problem. 
I mean, net metering just simply says that they're required to take the, per, the energy I produce if I'm not using it all, which I have that in my house. Right? I have a solar panel. If I don't need all of the energy I produce, they have to take it, and they have to compensate me at a retail rate. Yes, so. but what they actually do, the way it's actually implemented, is that the excess that you produce goes into your neighborhood. It feeds the other houses in your neighborhood. It, yeah, it feeds the grid generally, the electrons, and then nobody really cares where they come from. They just, as long as they're there. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the other comment is that this is all, so far, all been focused on carbon dioxide, but methane is actually an even stronger greenhouse gas. So yep. we're going to talk about that as well. Well, so methane was in that chart that I showed you because we are moving so quickly today. The impact of natural gas production is so high from leaking methane that it may actually be worse than coal. We just don't really understand that right now. Well, I'm thinking about cattle, yeah. for example. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. in foods, one of the things you can do to reduce your footprint is to eat less meat. Thank you. So um, we're going to try to fit a whole bunch of stuff in here, which is why we're trying to kind of rush through the presentations. Um, I wanted to say uh, something that I hope will be a little bit um, optimistic and then uh, give you a little bit of a context, time context. The optimism is we don't have to do everything right this minute. And in fact, it would be a, to, to set out for individuals and for, the, um, for institutions across the diocese, for example, to be carbon net zero. We don't have to do it, do it all right this minute. It's so important, though, to have a long-term, specific, practical, actionable plan to get to carbon net zero by a specific date. And so I want to propose, actually, that that date might be 2030. And, the, and the, uh, the number 2030 comes from a whole set of things that are happening right now in the world. Uh, one is that within the next few days, so the Washington State Legislature has already passed in both houses, the governor is now poised to sign the clean en Washington Clean Energy Bill which requires that Washington state as a whole be net zero carbon in energy by the year 2030. As a matter of fact, by 2025, every single coal-fired generating plant in our state will be shut down. Secondly, uh, Washington state, another bill that is passing the legislature and will get signed very shortly is the Clean Building, Washington Clean Buildings Act, which, which lays out a whole roadmap for how every building in Washington state could be carbon net zero by 2030. Thirdly, um, by clean is legislation in the, in, the leg in the legislature right now uh, being considered probably will pass. It requires that all new building that is public in the state of Washington uh, by 2030, or immediately actually, be um, uh, measure the carbon emissions connected with any of the ma building materials and then choose, intel intelligently and intentionally choose low carbon materials. Um, fourth, there's, a, my phone keeps on going black, so I have to do this. Um, the city of Seattle is made up, has made a citywide level uh, commitment, that is the city council and the mayor, that Seattle will be zero net carbon in energy by 2030. That actually took place a year and a half ago. And finally, um, what Jeff mentioned, the. Uh, Energy in Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act may, me may mean that within the next year or two, uh, we'll, we'll see a, a national carbon tax that is carbon neutral and, or re rather revenue neutral, and stands a pretty decent chance of getting bi bipartisan support. So with that as kind of an outline, um, I'd like Penelope to come up and talk about uh, money, and investments, and resources. Thank you. And you know how to... Push that little arrow right there to move it. Hey, there it is. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. I really appreciate it. Um, so we've talked a lot about just carbon in general. Ooh. And uh, today I wanted to spend some time uh, sharing a little bit about me. Uh, and I have eight minutes, so ah. chop, chop. Um, so I'm hearing all of this about carbon today, and I feel like I'm living my legacy in this moment. Uh, I actually grew up in a fossil grew up in a fossil fuel family. My grandfather was a wildcatter, and I was the kid that was awake playing outside with the horn toads and tumbleweeds, and 
I was the tomboy and uh, went to college and I loved wind and solar and I would come home on the weekends, this was in the 80s, and I would say Big Jim, that was his name. Big Jim, why don't we redirect some money in research and development for wind and solar? Guess what he did? <laughs> That's exactly what he did. He laughed, he laughed at me. And so I thought, mm, dang. I didn't give up though. Like millennials today, I did not give up. So I ended up getting in financial services because I didn't think the oil industry was where I saw my future, right, my destiny. Uh, I saw a different GPS setting for me, if you will. And so I got into finance and when oil topped $149 a barrel, guess what I did? Big Jim, what about now? Does it make sense? And this was in 2001, right, or actually 2008, right as the market was about to go crazy. And you know what he said? He did not laugh this time. He actually said it made sense. He said, all the easy oil is up, what's left is hard to get to, and it's expensive. So I said to Big Jim, I'm a visionary, so I'm happy to be here today to be talking about carbon offsets and be talking about uh, how you can invest as an individual, how you can invest as a foundation or an organization, and the landscape that's out there. So with the few minutes that I have today, we're gonna look at the landscape. I'm not gonna go in real deep on details because we don't have the time for that, but I'm going to leave you some resources, and I'm always available. Uh, to continue the conversation after this, okay? All right, so the GPS of investing. How many of you have heard of this phrase ESG? What the heck is that? Oh, good. What is that? Uh, environmentally, social, uh, it's Go more of a government. screening. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of divestment, it's like a screening uh, who's doing the good, positive stuff in the areas that we want to impact. That's right, yeah. ESG. That's exactly right, environmental, social, and governance. So when you think about, this is sort of where I grew up actually, hard times and tumbleweeds, right? Um, so when you think about taking a road trip back in the 1980s, you probably went to Rand McNally, got a map, you got a trip tick, they, they wrote it out for you, right? And you went on your way. As soon as you hit the road though, the details on that map were dated, right? But today, what do we do when we take a trip? Or I don't know if everybody does this, but how many of you use a GPS? Yeah, you punch in the information. It tells you where to go, it tells you current, uh, Weather can, it can tell you current road conditions. It can tell you the shortest route to your, to your goal or your objective. Well, ESG is a way of investing that's like a GPS system. It brings in real-time data. It looks at environmental, social, and governance information, and it applies it to companies and portfolios. You can do it on an institutional level. You can do it on an individual level. So let's take a look at a couple of things uh, related to the trends right now in this thing called ESG. So there's an organization called uh, the this is the founder of USF, uh, and they look at social and responsible investing across the United States. And every two years, they do what's called the Trends Report, and this just came out. And so what I want to show you is uh, the trend. Typically, most people think of investing as just you take your money and you put it in the bank, you take your money, you go to an advisor, and they, they do something over here, and then you get your money at the end. And you don't really ask questions. You don't always align it with your values. Well, this ESG investing chart that we're looking at is looking at how managers <coughs> today are incorporating this type of investing. And what we're finding since 1995, which is when they began this report, uh, that more and more investors, both in institutional and individuals, are adding this type of investing strategy into their portfolios. What's really interesting about this, uh, the trend started back in 1995 when they began at $639 billion. That's what that represents at the end of the chart. If you move your way forward, that goes all the way up to $12 trillion. If you average that out, that's a 13.6% return, average annual return. That's pretty darn good. But what's fascinating to me is when you look at this chart at 2016 and 2018, that's a parabolic jump. That's a 36% jump in this type of investing. And you're like, well, why? Why is this coming to the front so quickly? I think it's a function of technology. Technology is giving us the information. It's shareholder activism. You'll notice the different colors of the chart that uh, blue section would be the ESG uh, metrics being used by asset managers. Uh, the brown is an overlay strategy where they're doing a combination of that and they're engaging companies. So you can actually go and talk to companies that you own and it's called shareholder activism where you can just go eye to eye and say, I think you need to look at your environmental practices, Amazon. I think you have an issue with carbon footprint. Uh, that's what that orange line is. So this is a combination and a trend that's very exciting. I think it's showing us a shift that uh, we can use our dollars for good. Does that make sense? Good. All right, so today the landscape of this type of investing uh, has grown. It's been amazing to watch how it's done. Uh, if you look at the bookends of this chart, 
like I said earlier, classic investing really doesn't look at anything but, let's say, uh, backward-looking data and financial information. Uh, you can do things like price to earnings. You can look at inventories and things like that. That's what your traditional investing or classic investing does. They look at traditional fundamental financials, which are really important when it comes to investing. But in today's world, um, we find that there are off-balance sheet or what are called intangible things, like your reputational risk and other uh, components that are really important to investing that something like a financial statement would not capture. So I'd like to use this example. If I were to know you as a resume, is that all of you that I would know? Isn't there a whole lot more of you than what would be on your CV or your resume? Well, this is sort of like the, the classic investing represents using those fundamentals only when you invest. So back in the day, you would put your money in a classic investment, which again is on the far, that side. <laughs> And then the, the far right here is philanthropy, and then you would give it away, right? You would invest your money, then you'd give it away. You'd work your whole life, you'd maybe create a nice uh, nest egg, you'd create a little trust or foundation, and you'd give your money away. Well, millennials have come along uh, in some function, as well as, I guess, hippies, trippy hippies, right, have come along and decided that they wanted to do some things a little bit different and align with their values. So the millennials, many of them that I work with, have said that they've watched their family members uh, work very long and then give the money away. But they want to make a difference today. They want to make a difference right now. They want to have impact. So in the middle, these blue shaded blocks represent different ways you can invest your money. Um, in the earlier days, we would use responsible investing. And that would be where you pick an issue that you don't want to invest in. Let's say, for example, you don't want to invest in tobacco or alcohol. We used to call them the sin stocks. That's what that represents. Sustainable investing is the next step up. And it uses these ESG, or environmental, social, and governance metrics. You can also do thematic things like water, if that's really important to you. How does it feel to know that your assets, or even your foundational assets, are working to build solutions in society that are going to help the next seven generations? Doesn't that feel a lot better than just take my money and do something with it? I think so. Uh, and then finally, you also have impact investing. And in impact investing, you have a specific goal. Perhaps it's a more socially driven goal, uh, where you want to uh, empower young women or you want to do wells in different places around the world. Uh, and you can take your dollars and go straight there. Now, in terms of economic return, they will vary across this continuum, and it really depends on what your objective is. I would like to submit, though, with the executive orders that are coming out recently, that one of our best places for job recreation is right there in that impact space. It's really amazing what can be done when you give money to a project that somebody loves, they're taking care of their people, and you're making a difference. It's like a triple win. So that's the continuum of the investments that we have today in the uh, sustainable landscape. So I've been talking about the E, the S, and the G. Let's just do a little quick, how am I doing on time? You got about a minute and a half to go. Holy cow, okay, <laughs> here we go. That's my trick. Da -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've already mentioned about, this is what the ES and the G represent. So we look at companies and we look at their financial factors and that's important. We also engage them on governance. There are a lot of issues that can be brought to the table when you're investing. You can look at border diversification. You can look at the carbon footprint. You can also engage communities for change. So it's a dynamic space. Uh, I just spent an evening with a bunch of nuns at the IPJC uh, chapter and they've done some wonderful advocacy work engaging uh, around private prisons. So there are lots of things that you can do with your money. So I hope I can impart at least that. And then finally, uh, the sustainability development goals have come around. How many of you are familiar with the SDGs? Got a few hands, that's great. Um, so this is a really important development. There are 17 goals. And I think what's important about this, above and beyond everything else, is there was a study that was done looking at the 100 most um, wealthy entities on the planet, how many of them do you think were governments? And how many were corporations? 70, 71 were companies. So in terms of making change, it's important that as a world, the United Nations came together and created these development goals so that we leave no one behind. Uh, and so these development goals are really important as it, as it pertains to climate there's actually two goals that are specific to it, but all of them revolve around climate in some way. So we are finding investment managers are using this and their GPS system as their destination, or any one of these can be used as a destination. Um, and within the uh, goals themselves, there are sub-goals. There are 169 sub-goals, so it's a very well detailed framework about how to make change, how to align vision, values, and make a difference because, and again, the goals here would be by 2030 that we would reduce emissions. 
and we know we've got a lot of work to do. So there are lots of choices within the investment space. Um, do I still have, what do I have left? That's it. Oh, too bad. Uh, we do have a resource sheet. Are you passing it around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So there, are, there will be a resource sheet, and I would recommend that you go check out some of these courses online. Uh, this is a great report to look at. It's an executive summary. Uh, there are also other uh, resources that will direct you towards sustainable and responsible investing. So I know it was quick, but. That, that was fantastic. Was that good? Okay. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Penelope, can I just ask you a leading question? A so, leading question. To do the right thing to uh, create positive investments and ESG related um, opportunities, does that mean you need to sacrifice financial oh. returns? Yeah, I didn't get into that. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's a myth. That's a myth. You do not have to sacrifice anything. Um, actually, when you look at uh, the PGE, uh, issue that the bankruptcy of PGE, um, you look at the portfolios that held PGE, none of the sustainable, well, actively managed sustainable investments held PGE. So it's a way of avoiding the risks. If you think about that GPS system and navigating around, that's what ESG does. It flags issues ahead of time because we're paying attention to those off-balance sheet items. Yeah. That was the answer I was looking okay. for. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I just wanted to really pinpoint that because there, there actually has been a very long-standing, very, very common assumption among many of us that in order to think about the moral or ethical implications of your financial investment strategy, you have to be ready to sacrifice returns. And the point that we're making is that is not accurate. Um, we've got a whole set of ideas and methodologies and ways to measure the impact and the success, the financial success or return of investments to show that doing the right thing actually is more profitable, generates more value. <coughs> so um, now I'd like, yeah, go ahead, Alden. I, I, I just want to align something that you said though, it's doing the right thing. Uh, Warren Buffett's the first guy who pointed out the following in the room I was in in 1994, and it's proved true every time. When you go to invest ethically, you can set a standard and you can express your guidance one of two ways. You can say, we don't invest in things that do this, or we do invest in things that do this. Your return will always be higher if you express your guidance in the do invest in as opposed to don't invest in, even if you're talking about exactly the same criteria. It's really interesting. Mm. Right. Cool. Excellent. Thank so it's do the right thing. It's do not the right don't thing. do the wrong thing. Don't <laughs> do the right thing is a lot more important than just avoiding evil, so to speak. All right, so I want to tell you, we want to, Algin and I want to talk just a little bit about carbon offsets. And to start this conversation, I want to point to the diocese uh, plan right now, which is a fantastic, positive, wonderful plan, to uh, it's an agreement with uh, uh, the, the, the Diocese of the Southern Philippines. It's called the Carbon Offset Cooperative Mission, and it's a reforestation project to create offsets at $25 per ton of carbon sequestered, and it also creates jobs and income in the Philippines um, and supports the social justice mission of the church in the Philippines. Uh, so this is really a tremendous, it's a very valuable and successful, um, successful program and we want to encourage everybody to think about it and consider it um, as one of the things to do as part of that third, measure, reduce, and then offset. Uh, so secondly, um, um, Olgin, would you come on up here and, and let's just talk for a minute about carbon offsets. Um, there's a whole world of c commercial carbon offset programs uh, quite apart from what we're doing in the Philippines. And um, could you just talk about a little bit about the quality of carbon offset, of, of commercial carbon offset programs yeah. right now? Uh, well, and then we want to talk a little tiny bit about um, what might be done about it in the future. So I'm taking some risk here because I'm going to encourage every one of you to support initiatives that encourage people to contribute to funds or to buy offset credits. And I want to say that the vast majority of offset credits that are out there on offer for sale right now are, are, are not legitimate. The, the underlying environmental value of the certificate is a tiny fraction of one ton. So, so I'm, I'm saying um, when you 
embark down the path that we're hoping you'll embark down, which is to is to get into the offset market. Um, that you start by knowing that you got to you got to do your homework. You've got to have you know, people running your fund that are interested in this. And basically, you're looking for a few things. You're looking for projects that do one of three things: they remove carbon from the atmosphere and retain it in the soil. They retain carbon that would otherwise have been released, or they recycle carbon that's in waste and 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 embedded in the built environment. Um, and that sounds kind of straightforward, but if you actually say, if you look at any offset project and say, does it meet one of three, these three tests, I would argue that around 75% of the time you'd see that it doesn't. So the trick to getting it right is to know what you're looking for. And don't not do it. Just go in with your eyes open and know what you're looking for. When someone says all carbon offset credits or all emissions or a ton is a ton is a ton, it's not. Just a, as an example of that, um, many carbon offset programs that you, commercial carbon offset programs that you might run into or hear about, um, it, it may be a $10 or $20, $25 car carbon offset uh, price that is a price for a ton of carbon, a, a ton of carbon, either emissions that are avoided or that carbon that is then uh, sequestered from the air the, or the uh, or some of the source. So it's interesting though that in some cases carbon off commercial carbon offsets like that are often um, sold through brokers that might take a 30 to 50 percent cut of the carbon offset. So actually what you may be buying is less than half a ton or even a quarter of a ton for the price of a full ton, which is one of the reasons that the Philippines program is so much better than a commercial carbon offset program. Um, uh, seriously, much, much better. So one of the, uh, one of the things that um, Algen and her company are working on is the development and, and release of a, um, the, the world's first um, carbon removal credit marketplace, which will be, um, actually I should probably let you describe what that means. Um, we're basically saying that if, if everyone reduces, if we actually all went to net zero by 2030, we still need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere to address the uh, exi existential threat that, that climate change is. And so we're not saying don't you know, reduce your emissions and your energy use. We're saying you've got you've to do more than that. And we think it's important that there be a discrete market that's focused on the more than that, the drawdown. Um, and so that's the market we're trying to build. So we need to get that number from 410 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere way back down to below 350. You probably heard of 350.org, um, the organization um, that works on that especially. But, but to put the numbers in, in context, for example, globally we discharge every year another 40 billion tons or so to the, into the atmosphere. Um, uh, seven doesn't sound a lot like a lot compared to 40, but if 50% of the farmers who produce food in the United States adopt more sustainable regenerative practices that not only draw carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil or the root system, but also tend to increase moisture retention and reduce um, leaching. If, if U.S. farmers were uh, had access to financing to do only 50% of what the potential out there is, and they only sequester a ton an acre a year when the max potential is three or four, that would be drawing out of the atmosphere and retaining about um, seven billion tons a year. Uh, so again, not as much as we need, but not insignificant. 60% of all of the productive soil, soil that's not sand, that is in the, on the earth today is, is in um, 10 countries, the top being Russia, Canada, China, US, and Brazil. Um, if you're, so, so going back to a whole other way of saying a ton isn't a ton isn't a ton. Um, when I was working as I was, uh, Short version of a long story is 2002, 2003, I had put together a consortium and that was the largest private sector offset credit buyer in the world. 
World Bank was bigger than me, but I was, I was number two. Um, uh, when you're building an offset uh, strategy, what makes more sense? Uh, buying offset credits off some registry that you know anything comes from anywhere, or sending money to the people that you buy your food from, uh, and social justice, and to the people in the Philippines because you've got a, a, a commitment to social justice. So we're tr we're creating a market where we're saying we're focused on drawdown, and we're thinking a lot of different ways of drawdown, but our top and first priority <coughs> is food production because um, uh, why would you send your money elsewhere? So uh, when you're looking at offset credits, be picky, be absolutely picky. If you're demanding, uh, we won't be the only entity out there that can respond to you. Um, and a ton isn't a ton isn't a ton. Your food supply chain, your energy supply chain, way, way, way higher priority to you than and, and your social justice, match match up your goals and stick stick with it. Great. That okay? That's great, thank you very much. Well, we're almost done here. Um, you know, I the first time I ever was at St. Mark's Cathedral, and one of the reasons I later became a member at St. Mark's was 12 years ago, I was here when Bishop Stephen Charleston came to St. Mark's. He was traveling around the country, and he was inviting people to consider being green churches, green cathedrals, green congregations. And um, since then, um, there are two things that have been true. One is that it's been really incredibly hard for a lot of institutions, including churches, to be truly green. Um, and that's been a little bit demoralizing for some, I think. It's also true that 12 years later, the landscape and the world is utterly different from what it was when Bishop Charleston was here. And the reality now is that technology is available, solutions are available, methodologies, plans, measurement tools are available now. We have it within our capacity as human beings on this planet to, to live in harmony with nature and in a way that solves problems rather than creating problems. We often don't, I think, because we think, well, the problem of global climate change, that's way bigger than I am. It's, uh, uh, maybe it's hopeless, maybe it's such a big problem, we can't do anything about it. It's too big for us to make a difference, or it costs too much to get a, uh, an electric heat pump um, HVAC system instead of a gas furnace, for example, or any number of other things. And also, how is this connected to the social justice mission of the church? And I think that we, we know, actually, that climate change is what drives every other significant social justice-related problem in the world. Climate change drives um, refugees going from one place to another in search of a better life. It drives resource depletion. It drives violent conflict. It drives uh, um, wealth distribution problems. Um, it, dr it drives every other political dysfunction that we can imagine. But faith, I think, um, my understanding is that it's not about either being optimistic or pessimistic, it's about being able to look at the world exactly it is, as it is, and then have a different understanding of what's possible. I recently read a couple of books um, that could have been a little bit discouraging, but I chose to take them another way. Uh, one of them was called The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. If you want to be scared into this, read that. <laughs> <laughs> the Uninhabitable Earth. Um, uh, David is a, a New York Times reporter and a New Yorker writer. It's a, com a comprehensive look at all of the problems that we've created for ourselves. And yet, at the very end of the book, David says, we know there are all these problems. We, know we have a very clear understanding of the problems that we're confronting. There is one thing that is an imponderable, one thing that we do not know about whether it's possible to save the planet and ourselves. And that is, we don't know what human beings will do. We don't know what human <coughs> beings will do. The other, uh, maybe even more um, daunting work, um, a long essay called Facing Extinction by a Buddhist nun 
named Catherine Ingram. And her assumption is that the human race is inevitably <coughs> headed toward extinction. The problems she thinks are so enormous that the crucial question is not even, not technological, it's not economic, it's in fact spiritual. And she posits the spiritual challenge in this way. She says, assuming that it is inevitable that we will run out of time, what is the only proper response? The only healthy spiritual response is to notice reality and then to say, I love the planet, I love humanity, I love all of the beings on this planet, and I will love and appreciate and work as hard as I possibly can to address what is possible for me to do. So I want to just finish uh, by reading a little, little, uh, a couple of sentences from, um, from the, um, the pledge to care for creation that's on the website of this diocese. It says, we will share our stories of love and concern for the earth and link with others who care about protecting the sacred web of life. We will stand with those most vulnerable to the harmful effects of environmental degradation and climate change. Women, children, poor people, and communities of color, refugees and migrants, we will change our habits and choices in order to live more simply, humbly, and gently upon the earth. A beautiful poem, actually, I think. Um, before you leave here, we have a, a stack of, of what, what I'm calling calls to action. And all the things that you've been hearing today, there are links to the web, on the website, on various websites, for uh, the bishop's invitation to take the, the pledge to care for creation. Uh, Sustaining Earth, Our Island Home is a, is a, a website that um, was created by the, on behalf of the Episcopal Church to track your carbon use and the, the use of your institution or your life. Uh, the Earth Day 2020 campaign, information about links to information about sustainable investing, um, impact investing that uh, Penelope was talking about, um, a donation that you could make to the Carbon Offset Cooperative Mission and uh, more. So uh, I'll leave these here as well. Do we have a few minutes for questions or? Uh, well, I'm gonna, let me speak to that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I love the way they did this because uh, in this frame we have three governing bodies essentially. We have the council, we have the board, and we have the staff. And all of you come at this from different angles, so they gave you pieces of the expertise they have. And I would suggest we don't have a ton of time for questions or comments. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll take a few, but then uh, what every governing body needs to do is think about which one of these would you want to do more with and hear more about. Uh, they're also coming to clergy conference, uh, or some faction of them are. And we're glad about that, and they're going to have a little more time there. So if you're a clergy and you're going to that, you're going to get a chance up there as well. Uh, and I just want to take a few minutes to say this, the pledge. The pledge, I thought, was uh, dismally set as a goal to get a thousand people, Episcopalians, over the whole Episcopal Church, yeah. out of two million people, <coughs> to try to get a thousand people to sign it in Lent. We didn't do it. Mm. This diocese, with all that we did, just over 100 people did it. When you talk about measure, you have to actually do something. The tracker, Sustain Island at Home, is the where you can measure and actually figure out what your carbon footprint is and what you're going to do also to help reduce Almost no one's gone to that. So I want to say presentations are fantastic and we can walk out of here and feel good about the fact that we did them, but we've got to do something. When you walk out, you have to do something or none of this will change. It may not anyway. I'm reading the Uninhabitable Earth. I want to go throw myself off a cliff. <laughs> That's what we're doing as a body is throwing ourselves off a cliff. So I want to plead with you to actually do something. 
in the next 24 hours, sign the pledge, go look at the tracker, and at least get started with it. And as a governing body, decide if you want some of these folks to come back and tell, talk about more, <clears throat> and get into it with you more. Okay? Enough said. All right. Let's thank them all. Thank you.